Okay, you can make your way with me to Philippians. We're in chapter 3 this morning, starting in chapter 3. And we'll look at the first 11 verses. We are only going to cover the first three verses in the sermon, and then we'll cover verses 4 down to 11, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday after, <laughs> in two weeks. Okay? Um, so, but let me read that for you. Um, before we do that, I just want to remind you of what we've covered so far in, in, in this book. Paul has now covered with us how to pray effectively. We started with that in chapter three, 1, verse 3 to 11. Then we looked extensively at the Christian and trials, how, especially how we should behave in trials. And then in chapter 2, the major part of chapter 2 dealt with how to live worthy of the gospel. Do you remember how we, as a church, not just as individuals, but as a church, can live worthy of the gospel? And then Paul gave us two examples. Two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, two models of what it looks like to... Regard the interests of others as more important than your own. And now we turn in chapter 3, verse 1, down to chapter 4, verse 1. It's a big section in this, in this letter is going to deal with convictions that every Christian must hold. Convictions that every Christian must hold dear to themselves. And these convictions, as you will see, has a direct bearing on your salvation. And so this first uh, conviction that we're looking at now, verses 1 down to 11 in chapter 3, is the following. Christ's accomplishments is what makes us God's children. Okay? That conviction is the heart of your salvation, as you will see this morning. Christ's accomplishments is what makes you God's child. Let me read for you, and then we'll pray together, and then we'll fall away. Finally, my brethren, in verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, because we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the righteousness from the... Oh, excuse me, to the resurrection from the dead. Father, as we go into this section this morning... We thank you again for your word. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, whom you have sent to dwell in our hearts, through whom we have received newness of life, who made us alive, who gives us insight, 
and understanding and grace. And Lord, we rely upon you and you only. We rely upon what you give us, Lord, because without you we can do nothing. And so I pray this morning that you will help us deepen our convictions. The conviction of the truths that your word gives us helps help us, Lord, that these convictions will be the bedrock of our lives and that through them they will produce in us a love for you and an obedience to you that is unparalleled in our lives for anything else. Please, Lord, we we commit ourselves into your hands for this work. Amen. To guide us then in shaping our convictions this morning, I'm going to give you three um, points that we're going to cover. Paul provides us with a command in verses 1 and 2. Then he gives us the reason for the command in verse 3. And then in verse 4 to 11, he gives us an example of someone who followed the command. Okay, so we're going to do verses 1 down to 3 this morning. We're going to look at the command and the reason for the command. And again, the goal here is to shape your convictions and help you live a godly life. Now, let's start with the command in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Verse 2, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. This command takes two parts, as you can see. Part A is the positive command, what you should be doing, rejoice in the Lord. And the second part of the command is what you should, well, also do, but it's kind of like a negative, right? Beware of, watch out for these guys. Beware of the dogs, he says. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Now, the question we want to ask here is, who are these evil workers? Who are these dogs? Who are these false circumcision? Well, a distinguishing mark of this group is that they do something that Paul does not want us to do. In verse 4, you read, excuse me, in verse 3, you read, he says, we are the true circumcision as compared to the false circumcision of verse 3, right? What do we do or not do that these other people do or not do? Okay, that might be a little confusing. Let me just say it simply. We are the true circumcision. What do we do? We worship in the Spirit of God, we glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. The false circumcision, guess what they do? They glory in other things and they put their confidence in the flesh. Who were they? We know that in Paul's day, there were many Jews, especially the Pharisees, who would go around to his churches and try to convince the Christians and say, guys, you cannot be part of God's people unless you are circumcised and you are brought in under the law. Paul says that's a false doctrine and will lead to hell. These guys who are trying to teach you these false doctrines are evil workers. They're dogs. They are the false circumcision. Now the question I want to ask first is, what does it mean to put confidence in the flesh? Because this is contrasted with rejoicing in the Lord. What does it mean to put your confidence in the flesh? Look at verse 4 with me. I'm going to draw out what it means from what Paul says in verse 4 down to verse 6. He says of himself, although I might have confidence even in the flesh, I have reason to put confidence. If anyone has reason to put confidence in the flesh, it's me. That's Paul's words, right? If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I have far more reason to put confidence in the flesh. What are my reasons that I could put confidence in the flesh? I'm circumcised the eighth day. 
I'm from the nation of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew from Hebrews. I'm pure stock, guys. Okay? This is like, you know, if I could put it into modern language, my daddy was a preacher, his daddy was a preacher, and his daddy started the whole denomination. Okay? (laughs) Pure stock. That's Paul. I have reason to put confidence in my flesh because of my heritage. Look at my background. My great daddy and granddaddy and granddaddy all the way back to wherever, you know, he traces his lineage right back to Abraham. You couldn't get better than that. Secondly, he says, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. I was of the strictest, strictest religious Uh, section of the Jewish nation. As to zeal for the law, I persecuted the church because I believed they were wrong and the law was right. As to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. When I was a Pharisee, Paul would say, people would look at my life and they would not be able to find fault with me. So not only did he have confidence in his heritage, he also had deep confidence, he could have deep confidence in his performance. Those are the two things. What it means to put confidence in the flesh is you put your confidence for salvation in your performance or and in your heritage. So, to put confidence in the flesh is putting confidence in your heritage and your performance. So, to put confidence in your heritage, what does that look like? Well, I'm sure you've heard this before. Someone might say, I was born into a Christian family. If you ask them, why should, why would you, if you should die today and appear before the Lord, and He asks you, why should I let you come into heaven? You know? People who put their confidence in their heritage will say, Well, Lord, I was born a Christian. My daddy and my mommy were Christians. They brought me up in a Christian home. I was born into a Christian family. I was born into a Christian nation. I am a Christian. Of course I can go in here. Uh, Some of you may be aware of this. But there is a group in the Val that I have become aware of called Israel Vision or Hebrew Roots who believe because they have a white skin and they are from the Afrikaner nation, they trace their roots all the way back to Abraham. And because they are connected up to Abraham and they have a white skin and they are Afrikaners, they are the chosen nation. That's putting your trust in your heritage, if anything is. Okay? And so they will teach you, that's why you can go to heaven. Jesus asks you, why should I let you come in? Yeah, I'm from these guys, you know. I got the right stock. By the way, that is wicked, demonic, and evil. And I'm not joking. That doctrine creates a deep-rooted pride and arrogance that is so unlike Jesus Christ. It's unbelievable. It is wicked and demonic and evil. So to put confidence in your heritage is to put confidence that you will go into heaven because of some kind of connection you've got in your line What does it look like to put confidence in your performance? Well, you're standing before the Lord, the judge, and he says, why should I let you in? You're going to say, well, I'm a good person. Man, I I was good all my life. I never stole. I never killed anyone. You know, yeah, I might have told a little white lies here and there, but I'm overall generally a good person. I went to church. I gave money to the church. I was even baptized. I read my Bible, I prayed my prayers. 
What do you put your confidence in? In your performance. I'm a good person because of what I don't do. Don't you find that usually, you know? I don't yeah, smoke. I don't take drugs. I don't drink alcohol. I don't watch movies. I don't. And the list is on and on and on. That's what makes me a good person. You are aware of the fact that there are doctrines, various doctrines in the church. One of them, I would just say, is called the Armenian Doctrine. It teaches you that you can gain your salvation, you can retain your salvation, or you can lose your salvation based on your performance. So in other words, once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, now you have to perform, you have to obey the law, you have to be obedient enough So that by the day you die, you have attained some level of sanctification that will qualify you to go into heaven. That, I will show you in a moment, Paul would say is demonic. It is evil. It is false. Because you are being taught to rely on and put confidence in the flesh. In what you can do to earn salvation from God. Oh, there's so many of these churches around that teach these things. I think of the Assemblies of God, the Church of the Nazarene, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah Witnesses. All of these people will teach you some form of relying on your performance. Keep the Sabbath, the seventh day, you know. Adventists say, keep the Sabbath, because if you don't do that, you're going to go to hell. Jehovah's Witnesses say you are saved by obeying God's laws and by doing evangelism. When you see them walking in the street, they are earning their salvation. No jokes. That's why they're out there. What does Isaiah 64 say to us? Don't have to turn there with me. I want to read it to you. Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments before the Lord. What? So, Isaiah, let me understand this correctly. (laughs) He's talking to the Jewish nation... And he's saying to them, who obey the law of God, he's saying to them, all your obedience is like filthy rags before God. Not good enough. Where does that leave you and me? Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17 verse 6. Well known verse. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. So in other words, if you look out over God's creation, there's nothing as deceptive as your heart. Nothing. No jackal or or wolf or whatever else, you know, would come close to the deception that your heart is capable of. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. That's what God says about your heart and about mine. Who can understand it? Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Paul quotes a number of verses there to again describe and explain the human race, he says, there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands, there's none who seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become useless. That's you and me. Useless for the service of God. 
There is none who does good. There is not even one who does good. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving one another. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now then Paul says, now what the law, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, okay, so that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God. Because the whole lot of us are sinful, fallen, depraved. And you want to put confidence in your flesh? (laughs) You want to put confidence in your performance? You want to put confidence in your heritage that your daddy makes you good enough to go to heaven? Christian, the Holy Spirit says, beware of of people who teach you to put confidence in your heritage or your performance. The Holy Spirit says, beware of people who teach you to put confidence in your heritage or your performance. In fact, I'm going to turn back to Philippians now. Paul felt so strongly about this point that he continually, repeatedly, warns the Philippian church. He says to them, to write the same things again is no trouble for me, implying he has said this to them before. Not the first time they hear this from him. I have said to you before, rejoice in the Lord and beware of these people who teach you to put trust in your confidence, in your your heritage or your performance, in what you can do to earn salvation. Why does he give us such a stern warning? Why will Paul repeatedly say this one thing to us? What will this command safeguard us from? He, in fact, he says, this, to say the same thing to you is not troublesome to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Why? What is it going to safeguard us from? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Now Galatians is written, this letter was written to a church that was struggling with exactly this problem. They were turning back. They had started following the Lord, putting their trust in Christ and everything He has accomplished for them, and now beginning to turn back to the law and saying, well, maybe, you know, trusting Christ is not enough. I need to add my performance. I need to put trust in my heritage. It was, chapter 5, verse 1, says Paul, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free from the law. Okay? That's the context there. He, Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't put yourself under that yoke of the law. Again, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, okay, pause there for a moment. If The context of receiving circumcision is, okay, I need to put confidence in the flesh. If someone would go for the circumcision, it means they are saying, yes, I need to put myself under the law to be a... um, to qualify for heaven. Paul says... I say to you, if you do that, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the entire law. So here's the point. If you want to put trust in your heritage and your performance, then you need to perform. You need to have a 100% mark because that's the standard to go into heaven. Paul says, okay, if you want to go that route, if you want to put that yoke on, you know, it's going to be heavy. And you have a real problem because you are a fallen creature incapable of doing what God requires. 
God not only wants you to restrain and not do the things that you think you shouldn't do, He's looking at your heart. What are the intentions of your heart? What's your motives? You know, uh, I put the stray jacket on, but yet I hate, I'm bitter, I get, you know, selfish. You can't restrain that, can you? Try and put a restraint on that. God wants a heart that is rejoicing in loving his neighbor or her neighbor, that rejoices in doing what is right. It is the food and the drink of your soul to do what is right. That's what the Holy Spirit accomplishes through the new birth. But I'm jumping ahead of myself here. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that it is, he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Verse 4, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Why does he give us such a stern warning? Because that road leads to hell. If you put confidence in your flesh and in your heritage, in your performance, you will stand before the Lord one day and you will be sorely disappointed because your best works cannot earn your way into heaven. It doesn't matter whether you were born into the church, baptized in the church, sat in the church your entire life, but you were never born of the Spirit of God. Your trust and reliance have always been on your performance and your, in- your heritage. <coughs> you will not receive what you are hoping to receive. That's why he warns us. Do not put your confidence in the flesh. Rather, do what? Rather... Rejoice in the Lord. That's the first part of this command. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. (coughs) Rather than putting your confidence in your heritage or your performance, the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord. (coughs) Now, the context of, of this command is... In contrast to putting your confidence of salvation in your heritage and your performance, He wants you to put your confidence in Jesus Christ and everything He has accomplished. That's what it means to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord means to confidently and completely rely on and celebrate, delight in and be elated about what the Lord has accomplished for your salvation. That's it. Do you understand that when Jesus Christ hangs on the cross, He fulfills everything that you need. His entire life his, his, that He lived and the death He died is enough for you to go to heaven. If you stand before God and your reliance is upon what Jesus Christ has accomplished for you, then you will be able to say, Lord, I rely on what Jesus has done for me. Through His death, I received forgiveness for my sin. Through His death, I received the Holy Spirit, through whom I have been living unto you. Through His life, I was accredited with His righteousness. His goodness was given to me. It's His merits. All of it is His merits. Uh, Some of you men will be able to identify with this, but I find it very difficult to cry. (laughs) Okay? So sometimes, you know, you, you, you wish, man, I wish I could cry right now. Did you guys get that? You don't? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, but some of you will, will know that. Why are you, you're so frustrated and you're so sad and you just can't cry. There's twice in my life that I cried spontaneously that it was like, you know, oh, that's nice. The first was, the first was, the first was 
when I held my firstborn son. For some reason, it just happened. You know, I like, sat there with this little baby and these little baboon hands, and my eye just went, Poof! and I couldn't help myself. Oh, you know, it's wonderful. The other time was the first time I sang this song in Christ alone. I stood there, it was in a church in Cape Town, I stood there and it's the first time I sang this song and as I sing this song, the truths just keep hitting my heart. How the Lord has completed everything for me. And I, could just, I couldn't help it. I was standing there, you're like, you know, in, in, you know, in, what, in, in public, <laughs> I'm crying. Oh, Christ alone. <laughs> but it was so brilliant. Listen to this. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Not in my heritage, not in what I can do, my performance. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when strivings cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Done. Tetelestai. There in the ground His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he arose. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to the final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home. Here, in the power of Christ, I'll stand. That's what it is to rejoice in the Lord. What do we do when we rejoice in someone? Don't we sing songs about him? I remember when I met myself. You know, I rejoiced in her. Like, I literally wrote poems about her. I still got them. Okay? Because I was happy. That's what we do. You rejoice in everything that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has accomplished for you. That's why we write these songs. We rejoice in everything He has done for us and accomplished for us. And that's why we sing them. So, Christian... The command is to rejoice in the Lord and beware of anyone who wants to deviate you from putting your confidence in Him alone. Who wants you to put your confidence in Him but also make sure that you perform well enough. No. Look, let me, let me give you a small illustration of this. But here's Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. And in chapter 6, excuse me, not chapter 6, chapter 5, he says to them, don't you know, I'm reading in chapter 6, it is chapter 6, verse 9, don't you know that the righteous, the unrighteous, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, that's the truth. If that's the pattern of your life, if you are called, if you are a drunkard by habit, right? If that's the way you live, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, Paul says. So does that mean my performance is important? Pause for a moment. Verse 11. Such were some of you. You used to live that way. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. 
What is he saying to them? Guys, through the death of Christ, you've been born again. You've been washed, sanctified, cleansed from that old life. Don't live like that anymore. Okay? You are not saved because you're not living like that anymore. You live like that. You don't live like that anymore because you are saved. Does that make sense? God does a work in your heart. That's why you live different. You are not saved because you live different. But you live different because you are saved. So when you stand before the Lord, you will have confidence that you have been saved because through the work of God in your heart, that newness of life says, I want to obey, Lord. I'm fighting for obedience. But Lord, I can go in here because of what Jesus has done for me. I rely on Him. Now the evidence that you rely on Him is a changed life, okay? The evidence that you rely on Him is a changed life. So the, con- the, the command, Christian is to rely on Him. That The truth that helps you obey that command is the conviction I want to lay in your heart this morning. The truth that helps you rejoice in the Lord is very simple. Christ's accomplishments is what makes us children of God. That's it. It's what He accomplished on the cross and through His life that makes you a child of God. Not your performance, nor your, in, nor your heritage. Now that brings us to the reason for the command. I'm going to try and speed up here, but that re- brings us to the reason for the command. Read with me verse 3 in uh, Philippians. He says... Let me read verse 2 together. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. The people want to teach you to trust your heritage and your performance for salvation. Why? Because we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and, excuse me, and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Let's step back for a moment and just ask the question, what is the deal with circumcision? We know what it is, okay? But in the Old Testament, the first time we hear about circumcision was in Genesis chapter 17, when God gives the circumcision to Abraham as a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham. Turn there with me, perhaps. It's good if we read it so that you can get a good idea of what this is that we are talking about. Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, Verse 10. This is my covenant, says God, to Abraham, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. (coughs) Pause there for a moment. You can understand why the Jews made such a big deal of this. If you are not circumcised, you're not part of this covenant. Understandable. Understandable. Every male among you, verse 12, who is eight days old, shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house, or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants, a servant who is born in your house, or who is bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So God says... If you want to be part of this covenant, you need to be circumcised. Even if you're a slave bought with money, in other words, they bought slaves from other nations, right? They need to be circumcised. If you're not circumcised, you're not part of this people. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. So, 
So, first of all, we see that circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. It is a sign that God gave Abraham and then commanded that anyone and everyone who wants to be part of the people of God, part of the line of Abraham, the nation that came from his loins, they had to be circumcised. Chapter 14, excuse me, I said chapter 12, verse 48. Chapter 12, verse 48. I just wanted you to see that if you are not circumcised, how severe the the cutoff is, if you will. But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. So this is a stranger. He's not born of Israel, right? He's maybe from one of the surrounding nations. If they want to come and join in the celebrations these covenantal celebrations that that the nation um, celebrated, if they wanted to do that, what had to happen? They had to be circumcised. uh, But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near to celebrate it, and he shall be like a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person may eat of the Passover. If you were not circumcised, you were not part of the nation, and you could not take part of its religion. Period. What is the meaning of this symbol? Circumcision is a sign, says God. It's a symbol. It points to something. What does it point to? The short answer is separation and purity. Okay, separation I draw out of Exodus chapter 12, verse 48 and 49. We read, just read that. If you were, not, if you were cir- circumcised, you were separated from the other nations. You are now part of these people. And you are not part of this covenant. Secondly, circumcision also symbolized purity. Purity, okay? In Isaiah 52, verse 1, a very clear indication that if you were not circumcised, if you were uncircumcised, you were unclean. In fact, circumcision later is used for unclean... uh, uh, So, in Exodus chapter 6, you read of uncircumcised lips, okay, which means the lips were unclean. You also had uncircumcised ears, which means the ears were unclean, and uncircumcised hearts. Uh, the fruit of a tree that is unclean is spoken of as uncircumcised. So circumcision had some connection with purity, particularly moral purity. In in Jeremiah chapter 9, I'm going to read that for you. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 25. The context here is, uh, the, the nation who was, well, Jeremiah was speaking to the nation about their idolatry. Jeremiah 9, chapter 9, verse 25. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Okay, you have the physical circumcision, but you're not living the way a circumcised person should be living. Excuse me. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. What this uncircumcision means is they were not faithful to the covenant. They were unclean. So circumcision, the symbolism of circumcision has to do with separation and purity, especially moral purity. So God gave the symbolism of the circumcision as a sign of Israel's separation unto himself and their purity. They have been cleansed and separated and set apart for God. Now here's the reason 
for the command to rejoice in the Lord and not in the flesh. You see, under the new covenant, the symbolism of the circumcision find their realities, their fulfillment. What happens under the new covenant? Through the blood of Christ, you are washed, purified, sanctified, and set apart. Okay? Everything that the symbolism was pointing to find their realities in Christ. That's why you don't have to be circumcised. Paul says, you who rejoice in the Lord, who put your trust and your confidence in Him alone, you are the true circumcision. Why? Because you've received the realities. We are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory, rejoice in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. The symbol is not relevant anymore. We don't need circumcision anymore since we have the realities. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Let me read for you from verse 9. In Him, that's in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him, that's in Jesus, you have been made complete. You don't need anything anymore for salvation. You receive everything in Him. And He is the head of all rule and authority. And in Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. <coughs> in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That body of the flesh is the old fallen nature, right? The power of that old fallen nature has been broken over you. And through the Holy Spirit, you receive grace to obey God from the heart doesn't mean that the warfare ceases in your heart. Rather, it starts there. Because now the the war is between living according to the flesh or living according to the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. But the point is, from that verse, in Jesus Christ, you have been circumcised with the realities. You have been cleansed, purified, and set apart. You have received everything you need salvation in Christ. Christian, if you are born of the Spirit of God, if you rejoice in Christ Jesus, in other words, you put your confidence completely on what He has accomplished for you and what He accomplishes in you, you have been separated unto the Lord and purified by the blood of Christ. You are the true circumcision. Here lies the truth that must capture your heart and drive itself in like nails into wood. You who are born of the Spirit of God and put no confidence in your heritage or your performance, you who rejoice in the Lord and everything He has accomplished for you, you are children of God. You can rest. Christ's accomplishments, it's what makes you a child of God. That's it. Father, please help us identify those places where we put confidence in our heritage or in our flesh. And Heavenly Father, I pray that if there's someone in our midst today who has been living like that, who thinks that they can put confidence in their performance, who thinks they can balance the scales by doing more right than, uh, you know, trying to balance their more right with, with, their, with their wrongs, Oh Lord, I pray that you will convict them of the uselessness and the danger of that road so that they will come to see Christ as the only hope that they have and that they may rejoice in Him alone. And then Lord, for those of us who know you, who are 
rejoicing in, in you. I pray that you will help us do so evermore. And Father, we thank you for all that you have accomplished for us. We thank you that we can approach your throne with, with confidence because Christ has done it all. He has died the death we deserved. He has lived the life we cannot live. And now we receive the benefits of what He has accomplished by Your grace. You give it to us freely as a free gift. Lord, what this says about You is that You are good and kind and gentle and loving. There's no one like You. And we worship You for that. Amen.